Good morning, everybody. If you would stand on your feet and we will get started in praising the Lord together. You can, you can switch over to the, uh, there it is. All right, how great thou art. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all thy words thy hand hath made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great you sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, 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 how great thou art. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome to Garner Evangelical Free Church here this morning, um, all 20 of you. Uh, must be a holiday or something. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's wonderful to see everybody's faces. Anybody worshiping online, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, what a beautiful weekend. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, a couple of announcements that we have here this morning. Um, First off here, we have, uh, have a need for extra Bibles to be donated uh, to the Salvation Army uh, in good condition, hardbound, hardbound copies. Is that right? Okay. In any version. Okay. And we have a box for that out front. So if anybody has um, old, you know, well-used Bibles um, or new ones, either way, if, uh, if you can don donate those, that'd be great. Next there. Uh, youth group, Sunday school, um, is starting next week for both middle school and high school ages, uh, age kids at 9 a.m. This is Sunday school on Sunday mornings. Are they all together? The whole group of them? Yes? Okay, 845 for three-year-old through fourth grade, and then fifth and above is at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. Um, so be ready for that. Flashpoint. Um, Brooke, do you want to come up and give a quick announcement on that? That'd be awesome. Thanks. 
Yes, we decided to uh, switch things up a little bit um, for Wednesday night uh, for lots of different reasons. We've been praying about it a lot and just trying to figure out what meets our needs the most. And so we are going to do uh, something called Flashpoint. Uh, we also took a long time to decide the name, but we came, with, came up with Flashpoint. Um, we're going to use a new curriculum called Team Kid, and we're going to meet every Wednesday just like we did for Awana's. Um, we're going to go over um, a different Bible story each week. We're going to have games. We're going to have the snacks. We're going to have, uh, we're going to be memorizing a different verse. Um, not necessarily every week. It'll be more every month, and we're going to more memorize not only the verse, but the meaning of the verse, so it really sticks with the kiddos. That's kind of our goal. Um, so it'll be very similar to what we were doing, but it's just a little bit different um, with a different curriculum. And so we're really excited about it, really excited to bring this on. And so that will be three years old through fourth grade. And so they'll be here just like normal, um, still going around to the different stations. And we'll also be having a small group aspect um, in there too. And so uh, how they were listening to verse listeners before, it will be that similar type of situation where you'll have um, an individual leader with a small group of kids um, with their uh, during that flashpoint time. But then our fifth through eighth graders will also meet at that time, but they'll be in the Asia room with Jesse. So they'll have their own youth group time, but it'll all be at the same time. So we kind of split up the ages um, so the youth group could be at one time and then the um, three-year-old through fourth grade could be at another time. So if you have questions, please come to us and we can, me or Brooke Henders, Eric Mombach or Jesse, and we can answer any of those questions. But we're really excited to try something new. So, and if you want to help, we always will take helpers. So come talk to us about that. Thanks. So that starts in, not this coming Wednesday, the next one, the 15th. So like, like Brooke said, that's kind of a replacement for Awana. Um, if you were, if you were in love with Awana, um, please don't be sad because we're going to be, um, having just as good a curriculum, um, if not better. Okay. Uh, moving on. So another plug here for the Church Center app. If you haven't gotten connected with that, I ask that you please do so. Um, this is how we're going to be trying to roll out communications. Uh, if you have questions about that, please reach out to Jesse or Heather or Reed. Um, that'd, be, uh, that'd be great. Next there. All right, missionaries of the month are Nelton and Bethany Noriega. Um, they have some different churches and individuals considering supporting the ministry. They will be making decisions this month. Please pray for favor. So as, as always, um, missionaries have uh, direct need uh, for financial support as well as prayer support from um, people like us. So if, you, uh, if, you, if you're able to, please give them some prayer support that, uh, that they'll be able to meet uh, those, those needs. Tithes and offerings, as every, as every Sunday, we'll be passing baskets. Um, just pass them down to the end when we do that. And for anybody uh, worshiping online, um, you can mail your checks into the address on your screen here um, or sign up for e-tithing. And that is it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer here this morning. Our Heavenly Father, um, Lord, we thank you so much for the beautiful weather that you've given us this weekend. Um, the, the rain that we had last week, as well as the, the sunshine and the cooler weather that we have now, Lord, we, we, we can be reminded of a time of, uh, of change in weather. Um, please help us to let that be a reminder to us of the change that, that you've made in our hearts. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much um, that you've given us the opportunity to worship you freely here in this country. Um, at this time, we want to especially lift up uh, the Christians of Af Afghanistan, Lord. Uh, we pray that... Um, that, that they are either afforded a, um, a quick journey to you, Lord, or, uh, or that you would be able to help spare them. Lord, we, we understand that um, in this country we have a, we have a, a right and, and a freedom to be able to worship you. And Lord, I pray that that wouldn't be lost on us, um, that we are able to um, thank you for your mercies here, but also at the same time lift up those who are being persecuted abroad. Um, Lord, I want to pray for this church, uh, especially this morning as well. Um, pray that your hand of blessing would be on it as we um, move into this fall season and different ministries starting up, uh, this Flashpoint ministry, the Sunday school. Lord, you've got a, a plan for this church. Um, we pray that uh, we would be able to um, be the hands and feet of that plan here at, at Garner Free. Um, 
pray this morning also for uh, Melton and Bethany Noriega, that uh, the, the ministry partners that they uh, that are currently considering partnering with them, um, pray that, uh, that your favor would be on, on that, uh, that uh, partnership and um, that, Lord, that the, uh, the needs are being met uh, to fulfill your ministry um, with, the, with the Noriegas. Um, pray for um, just healing for those who are, are in, in pain here this morning, Lord, whether that's emotional pain, uh, physical pain, sickness, and all of that. Lord, you're the great healer. Um, we, we, pr- we thank you that you, we can come to you in those times of need uh, for both comfort and for healing. Uh, so we pray that your, your hand would be in, the, in those situations as well. Pray for uh, Pastor Wick here this morning as he brings the message, um, protect him, and help us to receive this message. We invite your spirit in to, um, to help us to interpret um, the, the words that are being spoken through him. Um, and pray that, uh, that your, uh, again, your, your presence would be felt here and that your name would be glorified. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you'd stand, uh, greet those around you, and we will uh, get started, uh, continue worshiping in just a second. in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer oh what peace we often forfeit oh what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms will take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Blessed Savior thou hast promised. Will all our burdens bear? May we ever, Lord, be bringing to Thee in earnest prayer. Soon in glory bright unclouded, there will be no need for prayer. Rapture, praise, and endless worship will be our sweet portion there. It's 
falling from the clouds, a strange and lovely sound. I hear it in the thunder and the rain. It's ringing in the skies, like cannons in the night. The music of the universe plays. You are holy, great and mighty. The moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever, my heart. We'll sing of how great you are. Beautiful and free, a song of galaxies. It's reaching far beyond the Milky Way. It's joining with the sound. Come on, let's sing it loud. As the music of the universe plays, you are holy, great and mighty. The moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever, my heart. We'll sing of how great you are. All glory, honor, power is yours. Amen. All glory, honor, power is yours. Amen. All glory, honor, power is yours. Forever. Amen. You are holy, great and mighty, the moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you loved me forever, my heart will sing of how great you are. Amen. You may be seated. As the baskets are being passed, let's continue our worship together, singing Crown Him. It's not my life to live. It's not my song to sing. All I have is His. For all eternity, it's not my righteousness, it's not my faithfulness, all I have is His for all eternity. We will crown him, crown him, King of glory. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Crown him, crown him, King of glory. Crown him, crown him, Lord of It's not my war to win, it's not my way to bear, by his mighty hand, he won the victory, we will crown him, crown him, king of glory crown him crown him lord of all crown him crown him king of glory crown him crown him lord of all will you 
you stand, please? It's not my blood, but his that stands in my defense. Oh, what love is this that won the victory? He won the victory. We will crown him, crown him. King of glory, crown him, crown him, Lord of all, crown him, crown him, King of glory, crown him, crown him, Lord of all, we will crown him, crown him, King of glory, crown him, crown him. Lord of all, crown him, crown him, King of glory, crown him, crown him, Lord of all, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Amen. You may be seated. And the kids. Kids are invited forward this time for their time of children's message. There we go. All right. We're in business. Well, whenever I have to come up with a children's story, I, I look around for stuff I've got and it suddenly dawned on me I see these things every morning when I get up these are my resistance bands okay so I don't know if I even want to go through all the trouble of putting this on but I'm going to put this on so I got a problem um, when I was when I was younger older than you guys but I was younger I'm so old I'm older than dirt um, but when I was in my <clears throat> 30s I started I started really doing a lot of distance running, and I'd, I'd, run, I'd run 45 to 60 miles a week. And um, I, kept, I did that for years and years. And what happened was I wore out the cartilage in my hips. That was really dumb. I was in good shape, though, I'll say that. So now I'm getting older, and about five years ago or so, I started having trouble sleeping at night because I didn't know why, but because my hips hurt all the time. And then I'd have a pain, you know, there's a, there's a big nerve that runs down your leg and that would throb, and I would lay there awake at night, and I couldn't get comfortable. So finally I went to the doctor, and, and they gave me a shot. They gave me a cortisone shot, and it helped. I felt good for about six months, and it started to hurt again. Then I had another cortisone shot, and that worked for a few months, and started to hurt again, and then they gave me another cortisone shot, and it fixed it for a while. And then I went back to the doctor, and I had a new doctor. And the doctor said to me, no more needles. Because apparently, if you have cortisone too much, it makes your bones weak. It's not good for you. So he said, we're going to put you on physical therapy. So I went to a physical therapist, and they gave me some stuff to do. Because what I found out was, when your hips are weak, the problem is probably uh, not with so much in your hips or your back. It's really up here. A lot of back problems are really front problems, like too much weight, and also the muscles aren't in good shape. And so you got to... Tighten up your core around here, okay? So it's all about the core. So they gave me this stuff to do, and then I got these things to help out. So every morning I do a lot of this. I pull against this band here, see, and I kick out, and I do, I do 40, and then I do 40 this way, okay? And then I do 40 like this, like this, and 40 like this, and I do a lot more stuff too. So I have, you have to have resistance in order to make your muscles stronger. Stronger in the hips, stronger in the abdomen. So I also do some other stuff, which I won't bore you with, but you, don't, you, you, need to, you need to have resistance to fight against it somehow. It turns out you don't necessarily need rubber because all you really need is gravity because gravity pulls you down, and if you fight against it, that will make your core stronger. So I also do planks. I'm not going to do one for you, but you stretch out and you try to hold yourself, try to hold yourself absolutely flat. Well, why don't I do one? You, got, you all want to see me do a plank? I'll do a plank. 
Okay, there we go. Okay, so you just go on your elbows like this and you do this, okay? And then you stay there for a while. First, it's really easy, and after a minute, it's not so easy. And after two minutes, it's not so easy. And after three minutes, it starts to hurt. And then pretty soon, you're in agony. So that's the whole idea, is to make yourself miserable. Okay, then you can do planks like this, too, okay? And then you can make your core stronger even by doing some push-ups, so I'll do push-ups. Okay, so that's, that's what you do. Resistance, all right? Yay! <clears throat> so I was bragging. I, I, did a, I did a plank on my elbows once for 14 minutes. That hurts. <clears throat> but it stiffens everything up here in your gut. And here's the deal. I can sleep at night. If I do the exercises, I do the PT. So the option is to have hip replacement. And that's where they cut you open and give you a new hip. So I don't want to cause the taxpayers that much expense because I'm on Medicare now. So we're going to try to do it with just doing the resistance. Now, it says in the book of James, chapter 1, brothers and sisters, whenever you have to face trials of many kinds, count yourselves supremely happy. For such testing of your faith builds fortitude. And if you give fortitude full play, you will go on to produce a balanced character that will fall short in nothing. The testing of our faith is a kind of resistance. It's like the gravity that we have to overcome. We're going to have difficulties in life. And what do we usually do when we have difficulties? Not this again. Oh, no. Complain, gripe, moan, right? Do I have to? Right? Let me, I can, Pastor Wick's whining class. You can kids really get really, really good at it. Really? Don't make me do that. No, listen. Whenever you have to face trials of many kinds, count yourself supremely happy. Oh, good. Oh, great. Okay. I remember, uh, let's see, about a year and a half ago, I was in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It was 10 below. I was coming home from a transition team meeting one night at about 10.30, and I turned a corner onto Highway 16, and I heard, Poof! the front tire blew out. Boom, 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 boom. I pulled off into a parking lot, 10 below, the wind was blowing, and I said, oh, great! <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for this challenge. Well, I didn't say that, but I did pray, oh, God, please help me not to freeze to death while I'm fixing this flat tire. So I was able to get it fixed. But at any rate, no, it's really hard to be supremely happy when we have to face trials. But when we have to face something that's difficult, remember this. It will make you stronger. If there weren't for this resistance, if there, were, if there weren't for that trouble, if all you had to do was lay around every day and click the remote control on the television, pretty soon you'd just be a big, fat glob on that sofa. You wouldn't be able to get up even. You'd be so weak. It's a good thing to have trials to face, and we're to thank Jesus for them. We should ask ourselves this when we have to face those trials. What can I learn from this? What is God trying to teach me? How is God trying to make me stronger? Okay, you can take your seats. <clears throat> I didn't even use the blue one. Oh, well. All right, we'd we'll like to ask our elders or whoever's helping here with communion to come forward right now and assist me for this. First Corinthians chapter 11, we read, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This memorial meal that we celebrate this morning is not an invention of the Evangelical Free Church of America, and it doesn't belong specifically to Garner Evangelical Free. This is the Lord's Supper. Jesus instituted this memorial meal in order that we might remember his sacrifice for us on the cross. And he established it in order that all those who know him as their personal Savior 
might participate in it on a regular basis and recall what he did for them. He died for us. If you know Jesus as your personal Savior this morning, it's my privilege to invite you on his behalf to partake of the bread and of the cup. And I'm going to pray right now for both the bread and the cup, and then we'll distribute them. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the provision that you have made for us so that we can have fellowship with you, a holy God. You have given to us the, the righteousness of Christ, transferred to our account by grace through faith. Jesus, thank you for your perfect life that is given to us as a credit, a holiness, Lord, that is positional, that nothing can take away from us. Thank you, Jesus, for taking our sin on yourself, for allowing your body to be broken and your blood to be shed in order that we might be forgiven of all of our sins. Help us to draw close to you now this morning as we reflect on our own lives, confessing our sins in our hearts as we pray together, and then, Lord, partaking of the bread and of the cup in faith that Jesus saves. In his name we pray, amen. Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. It's our custom here at Garner E. Free when we take the bread to hold it and then we eat of it all together at my symbol and we do likewise with the cup. Can you sing with me as we are passing out the bread here? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now. Jesus said, This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. In like manner, after supper, he also took the cup and gave it to his disciples. And let's continue. Uh, through many dangers, toils, and snares. Many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace that's brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead. Shining as the sun, we know less days to sing God's grace than when we first begun.
Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Drink ye all of it. Let's sing that first verse of Amazing Grace again, Jared. Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace of Jesus, grace that is greater than all our sin. In his name we praise you. Amen. This morning we're going to begin a study of the letter to the Hebrews. The first chapter we'll look at today and just the first four verses. Very interesting epistle in the New Testament. Our Heavenly Father, please guide us today as we open up your word. May your Holy Spirit, who inspired it, illumine our minds and our hearts to understand it. Lord, help our hearts to be responsive to it, to be obedient to it. Lord Jesus, help us to learn more about you, that we might love you more, that we might know you better. Lord, that we might follow you more closely. In your name we pray, amen. Before we get into this, um, coming up in our calendar of events is a prayer meeting on Saturday morning the 18th of September. So it won't be next Saturday, it'll be the week after. Um, Just a time for repentance and prayer together. Uh, We'll be meeting at 8 o'clock, maybe go on for as long as it takes. Uh, One of the things that we want to establish as we continue to search for a new pastor is that we're looking to the Lord. We want to make sure everything is clear. If there are any sins that we need to repent of as a congregation, that we do that. And uh, we want to be praying for God's guidance as we look for the next pastor. So it is time for us to start that. The assessment process really has been completed now. So I gave my assessment report, I think about 27, 28 pages, to the transition team. And uh, they're busy studying it. Now, we spent about an hour and a half looking over it, hit the highlights. Some of it you have already seen um, because it was just some of the things we did along the way, the... um, Listening to Jesus exercise, for example, the journey wall, all that stuff has been shared with the congregation already. I have a one-page summary of that report that we'll hand out on uh, the 19th, and we'll have our our pizza week is going to be delayed for a week so that we can sit around and talk about that. You don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. You can just stand around and sit around and talk and eat pizza, but it'll be there. And if there's any questions, um, I'll be there to respond to them. But there's some definite action that we're taking already and as uh, we respond to the assessment report. And uh, we're, we're, we'll be developing next a pastoral profile. Uh, who are we looking for? Uh, who does God want us to, the kind of person, various abilities and so on and gifts that person should have. So we're, we're looking for that. All we want is somebody who can do everything, right? And uh, but he's already got a big church some way, so we'll have to settle for somebody like me. But anyway, um, away we go. It, it, it's, a, it's scary, frankly, and that's why we need to pray. Uh, we want to make sure that, that you have the, the right pastor here, that God has led somebody here, somebody who feels called and is going to be committed to this place. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, this is a great church, and uh, I, I wish I were 40 years younger, then I could really enjoy it. Um, but I, I just love, I love this congregation. I think it's a great opportunity for somebody, uh, and it's, it's going to grow. It's going to grow. This place is going to be full. You're going to have to be setting up extra chairs. I think that's where, where God has his place going. 
All right, so to that end, we want to get to know Jesus better. So let's look at Hebrews, the first chapter, in the verse, first four verses. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than, the, than theirs. We're going to see again and again in Hebrews that Jesus is the greatest. He's greater than anything that we could name. We like to talk about things that are really good, don't we? When, if you discover something that's, that's really great, whatever it is, you, you like to share it. You know, even if it's a new laundry detergent that really works good. Like, oh, I really discovered something here. Last winter, um, I, I haven't been able to follow sports like I like sometimes, but I, I have always enjoyed Minnesota hockey, so I didn't go to many gopher games in football, but I went to every hockey game I could get a ticket for. And uh, even after I graduated and after we moved back to the Twin Cities in the, in the 70s, we went to a lot of hockey games. Hard to get tickets to see the Gophers play. Um, just a great tradition. Minnesota has great hockey. Uh, you probably knew that. A lot of the 1980 Olympic team came from Minnesota. Did you know last year in the Final Four NCAA hockey tournament, Division I hockey tournament, three of the Final Four teams were from Minnesota? I mean, that's just amazing. Now, wouldn't you know it? It was a team from out east that won the championship. But at least three of the Final Four teams were. I mean, that's great hockey. And because it wasn't the Gophers, it was some of the other teams. Minnesota Duluth, I think, Mankato was in there. St. Cloud State was in there. These are teams that have the high school kids from Minnesota. They don't go out of state to recruit their people. So those are Minnesota kids. That's great. I like to talk about the great of the greatest, you know. Well, who has the best high school hockey? It's a, it's a debate. Is it Massachusetts? Nah, it's Minnesota, right? We, we, got, we like to boast on the stuff that is the greatest, but the greatest of the greatest of the greatest is Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that over and over again. He is the best. He is the greatest. He is God's son, and he is God's last word, the final word in these last days. And by the way, we are in the last days. Now, that's not shocking news. I, I can remember, uh, I, I always enjoyed listening to Billy Graham one of the greatest speakers, by the way, of our age was Billy Graham. He could just was nice to listen to him talk. There should be every once in a while a preacher who says, Jesus, you know, like that. I can't do that. But he could make it sound really good. And he preached God's word, and he would always talk about us being in the last days because we are in the last days. We have been in the last days ever since the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. So it's been, you know, a couple thousand years, but we're still in the last days. Jesus told us to be ready. He said he was coming back again at an hour that we would not know, at the time that we would least expect. He could come at any time. That's what we know, so we're in the last days. And then we look at how things are going, and then we really understand that we're in the last days. Things are not getting better. Uh, things are going downhill. The, the powers of darkness seem to be gaining ground in this world. It's not a good scene, and we are in the last days in the sense that things are growing more intense, the darkness is getting darker, and we need to let our light shine for Jesus. Fortunately, we have a great power within us, the power of Jesus Christ, and a light within us that is brighter than all of the darkness around us. But we are in the last days. But God has given us the final word. We don't need any other word. We don't need any more revelation. And this is important to understand for this reason, that every once in a while somebody comes along with some new doctrine, some new idea, some new revelation, supposedly, that kind of changes the course of things. Uh, we're hearing that today from the rainbow crowd who's, uh, who are telling us that, well, you know, God has now revealed a different way of doing things, and things that weren't permissible before are now permissible. There's a big church up on uh, Summit Avenue in St. Paul 
that has a big rainbow flag on it, and underneath it, it has a quote. And it says, uh, do not put a period where God has put a comma. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that God has put a period on his revelation. The final revelation of his truth is in Jesus. There isn't going to be any further revelation that changes what he has already revealed. By the way, that quote comes from a tremendous theologian, Gracie Allen. It's a fact. Gracie Allen said that. Now, if you know about George Burns and Gracie Allen, you know, what? What? Why would you quote her, of all people? She was a professional ditz. Excuse the word there, but you know, she, she, she wasn't really stupid in real life. But anyway, why would you quote that person and put that name on there? God has put a period on his revelation. Uh, this also, by the way, refutes something much more significant than the rainbow crowd. It refutes Islam. Because according to Islam, Jesus really was a prophet. In fact, Islam teaches that Jesus was actually born of a virgin. They have a lot of respect for Jesus, but he wasn't the final word. God's final word was Muhammad. Muhammad is the complete prophet, but that's not what God's word says. God's word says Jesus is the last word. He's the final. We don't need any further revelation. We've got all that we need to know about God's plan of salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, I know I'm talking to the, to the uh, choir here, and I know you agree with that. But it's important to understand there's a foundation that we have in this. We, we don't have to apologize for this fact. And so when somebody comes along, like, like Joseph Smith, who's, who's got these, uh, these stone tablets, these tablets, whatever they are, that he could read with stone spectacles, I don't know how that works, but supposedly, and then he's got a different revelation and a different story and whatnot, that's nonsense. That's not what the Word of God says. Jesus is God's final word. Jesus and his incomparable excellence. It tells us in verse 2 that he is God's son and that no further word is needed. It tells us in verse 2 also that he is the heir of all things and the creator of all things. He's the source. He's the beginning. He is the alpha. And he's the goal of all things. He's the heir of all things by right of sonship. He is the omega point, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end of a very homely example about why this is important. In 1988, Pat and I bought a house in the city of Detroit on East Outer Drive, a beautiful home. It was built in 1937 for a Packard executive, custom-built home. It's the nicest house probably I'll ever live in. Um, and because it was in Detroit, we paid $39,900 for it. It's a gorgeous custom-built house. Two stone fireplaces, uh, 2,800 square feet, just a wonderful, wonderful house. Solid, solid wood doors. It had a heating system that had been installed in 1947, 10 years after the house was built. It was built, I'm sure it had hot water heat when it was built. All the houses on East Outer Drive did, and somebody wanted to have forced air, and so they ins installed this forced air system, which was rocket science for the time. It was a Waterbury furnace. It was a big giant thing down the basement. It had all kinds of sensors throughout the house. It had baffles that opened and closed with little servo electric motors. It let in outside air for the burners and the little flap that opened and closed. I mean, they didn't used to build furnaces like that in 1947. But for this custom-built house, for a Packard executive, he got the very best. So I looked at this monstrosity of a furnace, and I, I just wondered if it was all right. I wasn't sure that everything was working right. And so I called a man in my church, uh, Stan Kraft, who had a heating and cooling business in the city of Detroit. And Stan was in his 70s at the time. He was really old, um, younger than I am right now, probably. And uh, Stan came out in his old Ford station wagon and lumbered down the stairs and looked the thing over. And he said, oh, this is a good furnace. And we're talking. He's looking it over and clanking around. I went to go. And he got all done. And he said, well, he said, everything's fine. Everything's working just exactly like it should be, except the humidifier is not working. He said, it looks like it hasn't worked for quite a while. Do you want me to fix it? I said, well, Stan, where in the world are you going to get the parts for that? He said, well, I probably have them in the back of my, my station wagon. I thought he was kidding me. He said, let me go look. I, looked, I went outside and looked. The back of his station wagon had a mound of parts in the back like this. And he's digging around in there. Pretty soon he comes up with a box. 
blows the dust off it. It was the part that he needed to fix the humidifier. And he came back down the stairs and he installed it and he got the thing working. And I said, how in the world did you have that part? He said, oh, I guess I didn't tell you. I installed this furnace back in 1947. That's a true story. I had the only guy in the entire created universe who could have fixed that. And he came and he didn't even charge me. Oh, it's, oh, I'll, just, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. I mean, where else was he going to sell that part? I had the only furnace in Detroit that was left that needed it. So there you go. But that's the Alpha and the Omega. This is the God that we have. We have the God who created the universe in Jesus. Jesus created it. And he's also the heir of the universe. He's the goal of everything. He's the one who's coming again to take us to himself. Do you think he can fix any problem you've got? I think he has all the parts because he installed it in the first place. Isn't that good to know? He's the creator of all things. He's the heir of all things. What, what is amazing about this is that the people who came to the conclusion that Jesus was the creator of all things were the people who walked with him every day for three years. Now, how many people are there that would meet that criteria? The, the more time you spend with people, the more you find out what they're really like. Isn't that right? That's why so many marriages come to an end after a few years. You know, I, don't, I didn't know he was like that. I didn't know she was like that. See, and, and, and love has to last and endure and go beyond that. We have to learn how to, how to kind of put up with each other, but you never had to put up with Jesus. The, the more you got to know him, the more you realized there was something about him that just wasn't like other people. Oh, I'm sure it was in the mind of those disciples that day they were out in the storm and he was asleep in the boat and they woke him up. Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? And he woke up and shook himself and said, Peace, be still. And the wind died down and the waves got calm. And they said, Who is this? Because he's the creator. And all things are his servant and everything obeys him. That's his power. Recognize who you've got as your savior. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end. He is the goal of all things. His love never fades away. He's going to be there at the end, just like he was at the beginning for you. The heir of all things who has infinite power and authority. Your future in him is secure. Verse 3 tells us, He is the brightness of God's glory and the exact image of his person. The idea of the glory of God, there's a word in Hebrew, the Shekinah glory of God. It's that, that overwhelming revelation of God's presence. And it was revealed to Moses on the mountain. And when he came down from the mountain, he was, his face shone so brightly that people couldn't look at it. He didn't even realize that was happening. He'd been in the presence of the glory of God, and he absorbed some of it, and it radiated out from him. And when God made his glory apparent to the people of Israel, they would fall on their faces in awe. And Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. God's revelation of himself and all of his holiness and purity and goodness and brilliance. And he is the exact rep representation of God's nature. In the Gospel of John, Jesus explained to his disciples, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Now John also tells us no one has seen God at any time. The Apostle Paul says no one has seen God or ever can see him. He's talking about God the Father. There's something about God the Father that our humanity just can't, we can't perceive it. it, it it's beyond our comprehension. But God has expressed himself in the Son, in the second person of the Trinity. And all that we know about God and all that we need to know about God is in him. He is the exact representation of God's character, the perfect imprint of God. It's interesting that the word for this in, in Greek, there's, there's one word for exact imprint, and it's the word character in Greek. It said character. That's how you say it. He has the character of God, all of the aspects of God. Every attribute of God is present in Jesus. And we, as John writes, we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
In him is, is dignity and splendor and perfection and beauty. And then God has allowed that glory to shine into our lives. And we're supposed to reflect that glory. Now, I think we all reflect something. We reflect something of our environment wherever we go. We reflect something of the people that we hang out with wherever we go. It can't help but rub off on us. This is a Damon Runyon character who says, always hang around with people with money. Rub up against them. Some of it might rub off on you. That's what he said. So the idea was to get some money. Rub up against it, you see. But if we rub up against Jesus, some of Jesus will rub off on us. When, when Peter and John stood before the Sanhedrin, this, these learned men of, of the, the Jews' Sanhedrin, this council, well-educated men, were amazed that these fishermen from Galilee could speak so clearly and so forcefully for they were unlettered people. And then they realized, they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Jesus shines forth with the glory of God. And if we spend time with Jesus, which, which we do in prayer and in the word and in worship and in being with God's people, that will rub off on us and we will reflect it to other people. So here's just a challenge to think about for me too. Who do you hang out with and what are you reflecting? If we're around people who are profane people, who tell off-color jokes, if we're watching TV or movies that are, you know, sketchy, that's going to be reflected in the things that we think and the things that we say. So I'm not trying to be a legalist here. I'm just talking about the reality. This is the way it is. We're supposed to be a light to those people so that the good stuff rubs off on them, but frequently it does work the other way, doesn't it? Make sure that your focus in your life is on Jesus and reflect his glory, his splendor, his dignity, his perfection, and his beauty. What are you reflecting to the world around you? Then we read in verse 3, this is incredible, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The word here used in Greek is, is not logos, it's rhema, which is the spoken word with a definite meaning. It's talking about a single word. So Jesus has spoken a word that holds the universe together. One of the things I like to do, I like to read this sort of popular scientific literature and figure out things that I, I really can't figure out. I'm trying to figure out particle physics, for example. I don't really get it, but it's fun to read about it. But it's amazing what we don't know. It, it, given what we do know about the universe, there's nothing really that holds it together. Physicists can't explain it. I, when I did the little magnet thing, I, I was just amazed to find out that nobody knows why opposite and negative poles attract and like poles repel one another. They just do. In fact, wouldn't you think we would know something as basic as that? And we don't know. We, we don't know why there is anything, even, instead of nothing. The, the, the parameters of reality as it exists are so very narrow that the odds against our even being in existence are practically nil. Did you know that? But the Word of God reveals a mystery here. What holds everything together, Jesus? Just think about the, the size of the universe and the, just how massive it is and how many, well, Carl Sagan, billions and billions of not only stars, but of galaxies, each with billions of stars in them. It's amazing. And he holds it all together by the word of his power. Yes, there is something different about Jesus. This is an amazing statement. And it's even more incredible when we recognize in our context of just how vast the universe is. Who is responsible for it? Jesus is. He upholds it by the word of his power. And that isn't it wonderful what he's done with all of that power that he has for us. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now the writer of Hebrews is going to go through this little sentence after making purification for sins in some detail throughout this epistle. But here, there's this one little phrase. 
we're talking here about what we celebrated this morning at the Lord's Supper. We're talking about what we talked about in our Sunday school class this morning, about Jesus going to the cross, about him bearing the wrath of God against sin in our place. All of our sin placed on him, and we are purified by his shed blood. All of the things that he could do, he did for us. Everything that needed to be done in order to provide for us salvation, nothing left undone. He has made purification for sins. And now, accepted at the right hand of the Father, that work of atonement was accepted by God, and he's seated at the right hand. That's the hand of authority and of power. He's seated by the majesty on high. He's together with his Father. This is important theologically because the atonement was acceptable to God. It worked. And from that right hand of power, Jesus has access to the Father, and he intercedes for us, we're told in Romans chapter 8. He is our defense attorney. He takes our place, pleads our cause at the right hand of the Father. He's interested in us. He puts this great power that he has to work for us. You'd think he'd be busy with other things, wouldn't you? You know, I think one of the appeals in some other forms of Christianity to the saints in Eastern Orthodoxy, the icons that people pray to and, and venerate, and in Roman Catholicism, the saints, and then Mary, you know. He's got to listen to his mother, so I'm going to talk to her, right? It is really based on this idea, well, Jesus is so powerful, he's too busy for me. So I have to talk to one of the saints, you see. But that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, himself a man, Jesus Christ. We talk to him. And, and he's taken all of this power, all of this glory, all of this, all this vastness that he's got, and he's focused it on this, on us. And he's seated at the right hand of God in order that he might intercede for us. He's made already the atonement for sin. And now he continues to plead our cause. I, I'm, I'm really glad to know that I have a friend in high places who's taking care of me and looking after my best interests. Aren't you glad to know that? It works that way for all of us. There is a theme in the book of Hebrews we're going to see, that Jesus is personally involved in our salvation. He didn't subcontract this work, the work of propitiation. He took it on himself, so we need to recognize his amazing love and his amazing grace. Jesus, God's last word. We have no other savior. We have no better friend. We have no more effective redeemer. There is no greater love. So let's look to him for what he is. The greatest mistake we can make is to look for some other way of salvation, is to look to take care of ourselves in some way, is to look for some relief through things that we do or things that we may attain or worldly wealth or worldly friends. Nobody else is going to do for us what Jesus has already done for us, our only Savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you today for who you are our great and powerful, mighty, everlasting, eternal Father, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the final word. Lord, I pray that your Spirit would prick our conscience if we've stumbled into self-reliance or seeking after other things for relief, for salvation, for pleasure, when all that we have, all that we need, is found in you. When we think of all that you've done for us, that you've taken a personal interest in, in us, Heavenly Father, it's hard to believe. And yet that is what your word says, and we want to thank you and praise you for this. And Lord, we come to you again this morning. We put ourselves in your hands, thanking you for your love, thanking you for your mercy, thanking you for your grace. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. Let's sing once more. Will you stand with me? <clears throat> that first verse. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found was blind.
blind, but now I see. Now may God himself, the God of peace, make you holy in every part and keep you sound in spirit, mind, and body without fault when our Lord Jesus Christ comes. He who calls you is to be trusted. He will do it. Amen.